I'd appreciate that. And I'm gonna go ahead while people are rolling in and announce a few things. Um, you guys can check out our um, different events and services at coosbaylibrary.org. Um, we have a lot of cool virtual events going on right now and a lot of different services. Um, we're actually starting to do pickup and drop offs in different areas of town on Fridays, like in East Side and, um, and Empire. So if you can't make it to the library, if it's safer for you to go to one of those drop offs, you can find that information at coosbaylibrary.org. Um, tomorrow night, we have our community cooking with the co-op starring Jamar. It, we're gonna feature a uh, vegetable stir fry, and you can sign up for that again at coosbaylibrary.org and see everything else going on on our events calendar. And right now, I am gonna mute everybody except Taylor and I, and then Taylor's gonna share his screen. You can go ahead and start sharing your screen, Taylor. Thank you. One sec. Okay, we got everybody muted. And so I'd like to introduce Taylor Stewart from the Oregon Remembrance Project, as his slide states. Um, uh, he's the founding member of this project, and he's also in, uh, involved with um, the Equal Justice Initiative out of Alabama. Um, and I'm just happy he came here from Portland tonight to educate us about lynching in America and uh, everything related to that and where we're at today. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Taylor. Okay, one sec. Okay, I, as Paul mentioned, I'm Taylor Stewart and I have been working since the fall of 2018 to memorialize the history of lynching and memorialize Oregon's only recorded victim of lynching, Alonzo Tucker. As a forward, I don't work for the Equal Justice Initiative. I'm just a volunteer of my time and effort to what I believe to be this important conversation. And I'm grateful for you to be willing to have this conversation with me tonight, because I believe this to be a relevant conversation in the midst of the Black Lives Matter movement. In order to understand Black Lives Matter, we have to understand how Black life hasn't mattered over the course of this country's history because black life certainly didn't matter during the lynching era. And there is a legacy of lynching in America, but it is not a legacy we talk about. We don't talk about an era of domestic terrorism that left thousands of African Americans dead, sustained racial inequality, and forced the exodus of millions from the South. You know, when you go to Germany, you are confronted with the history of the Holocaust. When you go to Rwanda, you are confronted with the history of genocide. When you go to South Africa, you are confronted with the history of apartheid. But when you come to the United States, you are not confronted with history like lynching. Well, the Equal Justice Initiative is trying to change that. The era of lynching may be behind us, but we as a nation won't ever be able to move past it until we confront this legacy. The Equal Justice Initiative has documented nearly 6,500 lynchings between the years of 1865 to 1950, with over 300 occurring in states outside of the South. And in April 2018, the Equal Justice Initiative opened up the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, our nation's first ever memorial to the history of lynching. When you enter the museum, you're met with these six foot high pillars that have the name of the state, the name of the county, and then the names of everyone who was lynched in that county. There are over 800 pillars representing the over 800 counties where lynchings took place. This history goes from abstract to personal when you can actually read the names of people who were lynched in this country. What got me the most personally was seeing names with the last name Stewart knowing that simply time and place separated me from the name on the pillar. The pillars are originally perpendicular to the floor, but as you make your way through the museum, the pillars begin to come off the ground until finally, as you can see here, the pillars are hanging above you, symbolizing many of the victims of lynching. It is an extremely powerful museum, and if for any reason you're in Montgomery, Alabama, I highly recommend you attend this museum. Well, 
in conjunction with the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, the Equal Justice Initiative has implemented the Community Remembrance Project, which aims to work in the communities where lynchings took place to find healing and reconciliation through a sober reflection on history. I'll talk a little bit more about the Community Remembrance Project as well as what we're doing in Oregon a little bit later. So one of the central questions is, how did this happen? How did these gruesome images come to symbolize an era of American life? What was the social, political, and cultural landscape that allowed lynching to occur? Because despite what we may like to think, this was not the work of a few hooded vigilantes. Whole communities participated in the ritualistic killing of African Americans. So over the course of this session, we'll cover this untold story of American suffering, how we can find reconciliation, and how lynching is still a relevant topic to us today. And we'll begin with a video. After slavery was prohibited in 1865, formerly enslaved people in America were granted full citizenship, the right to vote, and under the 14th Amendment, protection from racial violence. Formerly enslaved people were promised land and opportunity, but most got nothing because America quickly devolved into an era of racial terrorism and oppression for black citizens. White people in the South were angry that people formerly considered property were now equal citizens. Many turned to violence. In the years immediately following the Civil War, thousands of black people were murdered when they tried to claim their rights. Soon afterwards, federal troops were withdrawn from the South, ending a brief period of racial progress known as Reconstruction. Nationwide resistance to racial equality resulted in the reestablishment of racial subordination through bias laws, disenfranchisement, and terrorism most dramatically enforced through lynchings. Racial terror lynchings of black people defined a shameful era in America. These lynchings differed from the hanging of white people in places where there was no functioning criminal justice system. Racial terror lynchings were directed at all black people. They enforced compliance with racial hierarchy and white supremacy and ensured racial segregation and denial of equal rights. In 1916, in Cedar Bluff, Mississippi, a young black man named Jeff Brown accidentally bumped into a white woman while running to catch a train. A white mob stopped him and lynched him, beating him and then hanging him from a tree for his insolence and carelessness. His public murder was not about criminal punishment, but was instead about maintaining racial hierarchy and terrorizing the black community. White town residents proudly sold photographs of Mr. Brown's brutalized body hanging from the tree for five cents each. The Equal Justice Initiative has documented thousands of racial terror lynchings between 1877 and 1950. EJI has confirmed the lynchings of over 4,000 black people who were tortured, maimed, beaten, shot, hung, and burned alive by crowds of white people often with the cooperation of law enforcement or government officials. The terror of lynching was so widespread that millions of black people fled the South and settled in the urban North and West as refugees of American terror, shaping the current demographic geography of the United States. On July 5, 1933, an older black woman named Elizabeth Lawrence reprimanded a group of white children who threw rocks at her as she walked home from work. Word spread that a black woman had dared to rebuke white children, and that night, an angry mob of white citizens lynched Ms. Lawrence for her audacity. Her home was then burned to the ground. Her son, Alexander, fled to Boston. Racial terror lynchings often had the atmosphere of carnivals, with food vendors and souvenir stands. Hundreds or thousands of white people would often gather to watch and take part in the torture and murder of black citizens. There has been no effort in America to confront this legacy of racial terror. While hundreds of Confederate monuments litter the landscape in southern states, there has been no public recognition of the violence endured by black people. 
On October 7, 1910, a white mob in Montgomery, Alabama tried to abduct and lynch black men being held in jail on suspicion of miscegenation or interracial sexual relations. When they were unable to get the men out of the jail, the frustrated mob lynched a black taxi driver named John Dell, who was sitting in his cab nearby. No one was ever arrested or prosecuted for his murder. EJI's Community Remembrance Project collects soil from the many sites where terror lynchings occurred. Jars labeled with the names of murdered black citizens are on public display at EJI, a powerful visual reminder of history we must face. EJI is working to create a permanent memorial to honor victims of lynching, a place to reflect on America's history of racial violence. We hope to place historical markers at hundreds of lynching sites around the country. Contemporary issues like police violence, excessive punishment in the criminal justice system, and even harsh and punitive treatment of children of color in schools and on streets cannot be understood without a deeper examination into our history of racial violence. More truthful discourse and reflection on our history of racial injustice is essential for us to achieve racial equity. Confronting the legacy of lynching is critical to advancing this conversation. We hope you will join our effort to help towns, cities, and states confront and recover from these tragic histories of racial violence through truth and reconciliation, where there can truly be equal justice for all. So before we can talk about lynching, we have to talk about the Reconstruction Era. Following the end of the Civil War, four million Blacks became freed people. This created a tension in the South between black emancipation and white supremacy. This conflict would come to define the era. And during this time, a cultural pendulum would swing back and forth between black advancement and white dominance. Black people's social and economic progress was met with resistance and they were frequently the targets of casual violence. And so the gains made through progressive reconstruction efforts were offset by the dangers of the redemption movement the political movement aimed at reestablishing white dominance. Racial violence was widespread throughout the former Confederate states and historian Eric Fauner writes that the wave of counter-revolutionary terror that swept over large parts of the South between 1868 and 1871 lacks a counterpart either in the American experience or in that of the other Western hemisphere societies that abolished slavery in the 19th century. And so we'll take a look at one of these acts of mass violence for the legal ramifications it had during the lynching era. Colfax, Louisiana. Colfax was the seat of Grant Parish. In Louisiana, they were called parishes instead of counties and resentment between Republicans and Democrats would reach a boiling point following a hotly contested gubernatorial election of 1872. After much chaos, the Republican would eventually be sworn into office and many Democrats planned to revolt. Fearing that a white mob was forming to seize control of the local government of Grant Parish, a black militia occupied the local courthouse. Well, at noon on Easter Sunday, 1873, the mob descended on the courthouse. The mob possessed a cannon and outnumbered the black militia two to one. Shots were exchanged over the span of a few hours and eventually the courthouse was set on fire. Thus being both outmanned and outgunned, the black militia surrendered. However, their surrender was not met peacefully. The white mob proceeded to kill all those who fled, surrendered, or whom they had taken prisoner. All in all, 150 African Americans and three white men were killed in the Colfax massacre. This event would be considered by many the bloodiest single act of carnage in all of reconstruction. So the events of the Colfax massacre very much so represent what was treason by the white mob as they were trying to overthrow the local government. However, Colfax would choose to retell history in a way that was sympathetic to the mob. In 1921, they unveiled a memorial in the local cemetery that reads, erected to the memory of the heroes, Stephen de Tour Parish, James West Hadnot, Sidney Harris, who fell in the Colfax riot fighting for white supremacy. Once again, in 1951, Colfax would go on to unveil a sign that reads, on this site occurred the Colfax riot in which three white men and 150 Negroes were slain. 
This event on April 13th, 1873, marked the end of carpetbag misrule in the South. Both this monument and sign still stand today in Colfax, Louisiana. So from the Colfax massacre, we got the court case United States versus Crookshank. Prior to United States versus Crookshank, Congress passed the Enforcement Acts. These acts allowed individuals to go to federal court when they felt their civil rights had been violated and it empowered the federal government to prosecute civil rights violations as federal crimes. Lawyers for the victims of the Colfax massacre felt that bringing the case to federal court was their best chance because a charge of murder would be unlikely to be found in the Democrat controlled state court. They believed their best chance for justice would be to appeal to the federal court and appeal to the 14th Amendment's due process and equal protection of the law for all citizens. Well, all in all, 97 men would be indicted in the Colfax massacre. However, only three would be found guilty. Naturally, the defendants would go on to appeal this ruling all the way up to the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court would go on to side with the defendants, saying that because the defendants were not actors of the state, but were merely private individuals, they could not be prosecuted for violating the 14th Amendment's due process and equal protection of the law. At the same time, the court held that the enforcement acts themselves were unconstitutional and that the federal government had no role to play in prosecuting civil rights, the civil rights of African Americans. That was the state's job. And so when Crookshank was decided, the Justice Department dropped 179 Enforcement Act prosecutions in Mississippi alone. Thus, the defendants of Crookshank and other similar cases had only to look to state and local jurisdiction to determine the consequence of violence against Blacks. No surprise, there would be no consequences. And with the tacit endorsement of the state, violence continued to spread and increasingly attacks on African Americans were carried out by undisguised men in broad daylight. During this time, very few people would ever be convicted for the murder of a black person. Of all the lynchings that occurred after 1900, only 1% resulted in a lyncher being convicted of a criminal offense. And so under the backdrop of United States versus Crookshank, that brings us to the Jim Crow era. Jim Crow would be the result of that conflict between black emancipation and white supremacy. White supremacy would be formally reestablished through both social and legal custom. Under Jim Crow rule, all aspects of life were governed by a strict color line from the most central and important to the most mundane and tedious. And so even though the 13th, 14th and 15th amendment endowed African-Americans with the constitutional right to participate in society as full citizens, those rights would be unenforceable in a world hostile to their existence. And so without chattel slavery, white supremacy and racial subordination had to be formally reestablished in American life. So what did that look like? Well, to begin, states began to roll back the progress that African Americans had made during Reconstruction. Blacks would have more rights in 1870 than they would in 1950. W.E.B. Du Bois would remark of this time that the slave went free, stood for a brief moment in the sun, then moved back towards slavery. Between 1885 to 1908, all former Confederate states rewrote their constitution to include provisions restricting voting rights with poll taxes, literacy tests, and felon disenfranchisement. Black people would quickly lose the future they thought they had been promised. During this time, Plessy versus Ferguson would become the law of the land and would enshrine the doctrine of separate but equal. As we know, separate would never be equal and black people would henceforth be excluded from many public facilities, institutions, and opportunities. And so Jim Crow created a racial caste system where violations of the racial order were frequently met with violence. This is how lynching sustained racial inequality. However, Jim Crow was much more than just a series of discriminatory laws. There was an intense climate of anti-Black racism that permeated the era. And much of that racism would be considered justified. 
because it was a widely held belief at the time that race was a biological factor that predetermined behavior. Northern academics promoted the field of scientific racism and concocted theories to legitimate the claim that black men were dangerous subhumans predisposed to rape. By the late 1880s, numerous American scholars viewed African Americans as, quote, a race that was devolving on the scale of civilization and becoming increasingly dangerous. And so scientific racism substantiated the claim that African Americans were subhuman, and because they were viewed as less than human, it was easy to justify violence against them. We don't even have to look back that far in history to see this play out. Dylan Roof, the tutor of the Charleston church, is quoted as saying, anyone who thinks that white and black people look as different as we do on the outside, but are somehow magically the same on the inside is delusional. Negroes have lower IQs, lower impulse control, and higher testosterone levels in general. These three things alone are a recipe for violent behavior. But it wouldn't just be scientific racism that portrayed blacks as inferior our entertainment industry would do the same because blackface minstrel shows were the single most popular form of entertainment in America at the end of the 19th beginning of the 20th century. After all, the name of the era, Jim Crow, comes from the most popular minstrel show, Jumping Jim Crow. Minstrel shows characterize blacks as lazy, ignorant, superstitious, hypersexual, and prone to thievery. These were the foundations of racist stereotypes. And so with their ludicrous dialogue, ludicrous dialect, grotesque makeup, bizarre behaviors, and simplistic caricatures, minstrels portrayed blacks as completely inferior. Minstrels created two contrasting sets of stereotypes, the happy, frolicking plantation darky and the foolish, inept urban fool, both of which justified the rollback of rights that African Americans had made during Reconstruction. But once again, the degradation of African Americans extended well beyond the entertainment industry, in large part due to racist chromolithography. So popular were they with the public, so widespread was their consumption, that virtually anywhere a white person saw an image of an African American, they saw one of these stereotypes of a subhuman, deracinated, beast-like being, which reinforced the idea of white superiority in the mind of white America. And so, these racist stereotypes were then subconsciously imposed on the faces of actual African Americans and contributed to the way that African Americans were treated in everyday life. Chromolithography in the American marketplace made anti-Black racism a commodity, widely consumed in the most unconscious ways, reinforcing the legalization of racism. And so, whether it was scientific racism, minstrel shows, or racist chromolithography, all had the purpose of doing one thing. And that was justifying Jim Crow and justifying the subordination of blacks and instilling the belief that they were less than whites. And so it was in this social and cultural climate that lynching would be both accepted and endorsed because of the way that blacks are viewed both as citizens and as people. This brings us to lynching. Lynching was domestic terrorism. And in this era of domestic terrorism, African-Americans had to live not only with the act, but also the threat of lynching on a continual daily basis. Because white individuals accused of identical violations of law or custom were rarely subjected to the same fate. And so lynching in the South increasingly and exclusively became a racialized tool of control over the African-American population. When the Equal Justice Initiative conducted their report, they found that most lynchings included one or more of the following characteristics. Lynchings that resulted from a widely distorted fear of interracial sex, lynchings in response to casual social transgressions, lynchings based on allegations of serious violent crime, public spectacle lynchings, lynchings that escalated into large-scale violence targeting the entire African-American community, and lynchings of sharecroppers, ministers, and community leaders who resisted mistreatment. So 
I recognize that the following images are uncomfortable. Unfortunately, you may not be able to see all of them with the side panel of Zoom, um, but they say a picture is worth a thousand words and I don't have enough words to accurately convey how communal these events were. And so I will let the pictures speak for themselves. I am torn between what is more disturbing, the lifeless black bodies or the sea of white faces looking on. Lynchings based on the fear of interracial sex. Nearly a quarter of the lynchings that EJI documented were killed under some suspicion of sexual assault. During this time, the mere accusation of rape was enough to incite a mob and any action that could be remotely interpreted as a black man desiring contact with a white woman was subjected to this heightened level of scrutiny. Because it was a widely held belief at the time that a white woman couldn't willingly consent to sex with a black man. And so the myth of the black male rapist permeated society. When famed anti-lynching advocate Ida B. Wells challenged this myth about lynching and asserted that when in fact there was a charge of rape, in many instances, it was really a consensual relationship, a mob burned down her newspaper and threatened to lynch her. This would be because of the immense fear at the mere thought of sexual contact between a black man and a white woman. The narratives from the white press were especially sympathetic to these types of lynch mobs and helped perpetuate the stereotype of the black male rapist. White women's rights activist Rebecca Felton wrote in the Atlanta Journal in 1898 that if it requires lynching to protect women's dearest possession from ravening drunken human beasts, then I say lynch a thousand a week if necessary. Lynchings based on minor social transgressions. These lynchings would be a tool of control designed to enforce social norms and racial hierarchy. Lynching enforced the rules of the Jim Crow South and established white supremacy as law in the social world. There is a saying at the time that what the law cannot do, the noose can. And so the reasons for these lynchings included things as simple as speaking disrespectfully to a white person, refusing to step off the sidewalk, reprimanding white children, arguing with a white man, bumping into a white woman, and other minor social grievances. And so not only were Blacks targeted for these types of arbitrary lynchings, but Blacks had to live with the constant fear that they could be lynched whether they intentionally or unintentionally violated social norms. I personally can't imagine what it was like to be black during this time and to have to go into the white community knowing that the simplest plight could get you lynched at any moment. Lynchings based on accusations of a crime. More than half of the lynching victims during the Jim Crow era were killed under accusations of committing murder or rape. This would be because the deep racial hostility of the time inspired increased suspicion on the black community whenever a crime was discovered. It didn't matter whether the evidence supported that suspicion or not because there was a presumption of guilt associated with the black community. This would be especially true whenever the victim was white. However, there was little attention paid to the accusation of white on black crime law enforcement and our social institutions made a clear distinction between the value of white life and black life because the mere accusation of black on white crime elicited community outrage. White people accused of murder or rape were given the right to a fair trial and were vastly more likely to be punished by the legal system as opposed to the mob. Black people were regularly not afforded this opportunity and it would be because of the color of their skin that they would be presumed guilty in mob trial. Public spectacle lynchings. If you could, uh, remember for me the first time you saw the video of George Floyd. We all saw George Floyd die before our very eyes and it was horrific. Remember the pit in your stomach, the heartbreak, the anguish involved in watching someone plead for their life as that life was being taken away from them. 
Now, if you could, imagine you found that video enjoyable. Not only that, but you found it so enjoyable that you got your friends together so that you could all watch it together. Not only that, but imagine getting a crowd of people together on that Minneapolis street so that you could all be there live for the killing of George Floyd. Because that's what public spectacle lynchings were like. Public spectacle lynchings were those in which crowds of people, sometimes in the thousands, gathered to witness the pre-planned killing of African Americans that included prolonged torture, dismemberment, and or burning of the victim. These were carnival-like events with food vendors, photographs, and the selling of body parts. It was really popular at that time to take a picture of the lynching and have it turned into a postcard that could then be distributed to friends, family, or merely kept as a souvenir. Either while the lynching victim was still alive or after they were dead, body parts were distributed and those body parts were kept as family heirlooms passed from one generation to the next. Public spectacle lynchings were bold public acts by the entire community that sent a clear message that Blacks were less than human and that their suffering was white entertainment. When I visited the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, our tour guide told us about her small town, her hometown. In this small town, uh, businesses close early on Wednesdays. Not your big stores like Walmart or Walgreens, but your small stores, your mom and pa stores, they close early on Wednesdays. They do so because that is just tradition in this small town. Well, that tradition started so that everyone could make it to the lynchings on time because lynchings were held on Wednesday. And despite the history of that tradition, businesses still close early on Wednesdays in this small Alabama town. Lynchings that targeted the entire African-American community. But make no mistake, Every lynching targeted the entire African-American community. Some were just done with that particular purpose in mind. Sometimes white mobs forced black people to witness lynchings and demand that if they didn't leave town, they would face a similar fate. And so in order to maximize the terrorizing symbol of the noose, some mobs conducted these lynchings in the black district of town and many other times, the body of a lynching victim was dragged behind a car throughout the Black community to send a message. These lynchings were designed to have broad impact and instill fear in the whole Black community. And who do you think had to retrieve the body of these lynchings? Black people. Black people were constantly forced to clean up the carnage left by the white mob over and over again. Lynchings of Black people resisting mistreatment. This would be a prelude to the resistance that Blacks faced during the Civil Rights Movement. The targets of these lynchings were frequently sharecroppers, ministers, and community leaders who resisted mistreatment or espoused Black advancement beyond the confines of the Jim Crow era. Lynching became a tool to keep African Americans in a state of subjugation in an effort to repress African Americans' fight for economic power and equal rights. We cannot discount the role that lynching played in creating a state of second-class citizenship and slowing African-American progress during the 20th century. It was nearly impossible for African-Americans to build wealth when building that wealth put them at direct risk for violence and the effects of that inability to build wealth due to lynching can still be felt today. So, Fortunately, you can't see the numbers on the side. If you close your screen, you can. Uh, but these numbers don't include the nearly 2,000 lynchings during the Reconstruction era. But when you look at the Jim Crow era and you look at the states such as Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia, Arkansas, can't see, but they're all above 500, it was nearly impossible to fathom what life must have been like for African Americans living in these states during the Jim Crow era one can even begin to fathom the trauma associated with these events, having to watch your family, your friends, your community lynched 
over and over again. We talk about how hard it was on the Black community to have to see Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd all killed in such quick succession. I can't even imagine the psychological toll that would have taken place had those all been brutal lynchings. I don't believe we will ever be able to fully comprehend the extent of this era of terrorism. But lynching wasn't just a Southern phenomenon. Lynchings occurred in states outside of the South. And when you look at the non-Southern states that had the highest number of lynchings, they were the states bordering the South. The same anti-Black racism that fueled the lynching era in the South existed in the rest of the country as well. Quite simply, there were just fewer Black people. And take note of Oklahoma as having the highest number of non-Southern lynchings, as that will be relevant later. And so because of lynching, we got the Great Migration. Between 1910 and 1970, six million African Americans would flee the South. In 1910, 89% of the African American population lived in the South. But by 1970, that number would fall to 53%. Our modern day racial demographics reflect this trend of movement out of the South. The Department of Labor investigated these relocation trends and observed that the most effective cause of the exodus is the Negro's insecurity from mob violence and lynching. There was a famous lynching in Memphis, Tennessee, where the lynching victim's last words were, tell my people to go west. There is no justice for them here. Admittedly, the growth of northern cities and the prospect of wartime industrial work did draw blacks out of the south. However, the terror of lynching and other and the threats of continued violence had long made the south a tenuous homeland and many fled because of this. I believe we must pay witness to an era of domestic terrorism that left thousands of African Americans dead, reinforced racial subordination, and significantly marginalized African Americans in this country's political, economic, and social life in ways that can still be felt today. We cannot say enough about the psychological wounds inflicted on the African American population due to lynching nor can we understate the psychological damage that the white community passed on from generation to generation in this socialization of violence. Nor can we ignore our state institutions indifference, complicity, and endorsement of lynching. I believe our collective memory and our collective consciousness holds power. And what we choose to remember and how we choose to remember history is a reflection of the soul of our society. We have the ability to remember this history, but the cultural landscape of our country does not reflect this remembrance. I believe in the power of physical memorials to set the course for our relationship with history. I believe that through placing physical memorials, we can begin to recreate our relationship with history in a way that compels us to learn from that history. And we'll take a look at one community that has begun this remembrance effort. My great-great-grandfather, Anthony Crawford, had an altercation at a store with a white storekeeper about the price of his cotton seed. Grandpa refused to do business with him and was arrested, and then um, was lynched in a spectacle, ritualistic killing at the town square in Abbeville, South Carolina, 100 years ago. WCLA, Abbeville, Greenwood, 92.9 FM. A lot of people don't talk about the lynchings in their family, and some of us do. For those of us who do, we represent a whole 
slew of people who are so traumatized that they can't speak, that their relatives did not pass down this history to them. So the Crawfords have always felt, I think, an obligation to speak up for Grandpa Crawford. We were all socialized that way. No more of this. This violence must cease. No more of this. No more hanging. No more of this. Terrorizing the black community. White mobs lynched more than 4,000 black people. 4,000 black people. 4,000 black people in the South between 1877 and 1950, and more than 180 of them were killed in South Carolina. As you witness the bringing of these vessels of soil for holy consecration, may you declare yourself a repairer of the breach, an instrument of reparatory justice that declares never again we are standing on holy ground. It was moving to stick our hands in that dirt and, and to look at actual soil that holds many family, too many people's DNA. I think it's a powerful way of symbolizing the history of lynching in the United States. And if we start telling the truth about our history, we could actually change the climate for freedom in this country. I don't think slavery ended in 1865. I think it just evolved. It turned into decades of terrorism. We're here today because there was terror in this region. Black people were pulled out of their homes. They were burned alive. They were murdered. They were hung. They were beat. They were shot. And that terror has to be acknowledged. Exactly. Yes. This landscape is littered with the iconography of the Confederacy. It is a false story, it is an incomplete story. We're changing that today. And we have to change it because something important happened here. A hundred years ago, a man named Anthony Crawford, a strong man, a faithful man, but because he insisted on fairness, a lot of people didn't like that he was doing well. So they didn't like that he could sell food and cotton to, to white merchants. And one day when he was being confronted by someone who wanted to buy his product for less than was fair, they actually arrested him because they couldn't allow a proud, strong, prosperous black man to stand up for fairness. And that wasn't enough. A mob of 300 people came to the jail to pull him out. A trial wasn't going to be good enough. And they took this man out of the jail and they actually dragged his body through this community. And then they took him to a spot, and they weren't content to just beat him. They weren't content to just hang him. They shot his body 200 times. When the family, the grieving family, whose descendants are here today, just wanted to reclaim their grandfather, the people in control said, no, we're going to let that body hang there for a few days, just as a statement to all the black people in this region. And that family had to flee, and it was an injury. It was a burden. It was an assault. And today we are here to give voice to that hardship. But more than that, we are here to give witness to the importance of what can happen when we come together and say, I'm here. Sometimes the most powerful thing we can do to be truth tellers, to be witnesses for justice, is to gather in a place like this and say, I'm here. This marker is a story about hardship is a story about bruising and cutting yes. and suffering. But when we get together, when we say we are here, when we join together in truth telling, we turn those cuts, those bruises, those scars into medals of honor. This is the most honorable place in Abbeville, South Carolina. We are here. We are here. We are here. banished. We were ordered out of town. To stand there 
when everybody was gathered and I can look out in that crowd and think about how many people got in their cars, how many people got on airplanes, to stand at that moment with the Crawford family as we pulled the cover off of history. America is a place where symbols are important, where markers are important. And that's a beautiful thing. When you read that text on that marker, it's the truth. And so where he died in an extra legal murder, we have come back with um, an answer to that that's permanent. That's a permanent marker. If you go do business in City Hall, if you go do business at the courthouse, you walk right past Anthony Crawford and he's looking back at you. So that brings us to the Equal Justice Initiative's Community Remembrance Project. This project encourages conversation and dialogue in the community on the legacy of lynching, as well as including three tangible acts of remembrance. We already did the first part here in Coos Bay, and it is up for consideration to complete the other parts. There are three phases to the Community Remembrance Project. The first is collection of soil from the spot of the lynching, the installment of a historical marker, and the relocation of an EJI monument. We did the soil collection back in February where we collected two jars of soil, one to be displayed at the Coos History Museum and the other to be sent back to the museum in Montgomery. The historical marker is two-sided. One side tells the story of lynching in America as a whole and the other side tells the story of the local victim or victims. Finally, there are duplicates of each of those monuments hanging in the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, and the goal is to get those monuments relocated to the counties where lynching took place. Currently, these monuments are off to the side of the museum in what's called the graveyard, as you can see here. And as time goes by and more and more communities begin to undertake the Community Remembrance Project, the graveyard will serve as a checklist of which communities have confronted their history and which have not. And so, as we begin this discussion of lynching in Oregon, it is worth visiting part of Oregon's racial under history to understand how we got here. Because it was not a surprise that a lynching would occur here. In fact, it was completely within the character of Oregon that a lynching would occur. Oregon is no stranger to anti-Black racism. When Oregon was still territory, they passed three different black exclusionary laws. The first was when Oregon outlawed slavery, gave slaveholders two years to remove their male slaves and three years to remove their female slaves. At that point, the free blacks had to leave Oregon and any free black who refused to leave would be subject to lashing. It was called Peter Burnett's Lash Law and the law stated that the lashings had to be no less than 22 times, but no more than 39 times. Peter Burnett is quoted as saying, the object is to keep clear of that most troublesome class of population, blacks. We are in a new world under the most favorable circumstances and we wish to avoid most of those evils that have so much afflicted the United States and other countries. And so again, Oregon passed a law stating that it shall not be lawful for any Negro or mulatto to enter into or reside in Oregon. At least one known person was actually expelled from Oregon under this law. His name was Jacob Vanderpool and he was a business owner and was forced to leave Oregon when a competing white business owner reported him to authorities. Finally, when Oregon became a state, it included in its Bill of Rights a clause that prohibited blacks from being in the state, owning property and making contracts. And that language would not be removed from Oregon's state constitution until 1926. This Oregon was the first state to enter into the union with black exclusionary laws, essentially making it a whites only state. And so it was only natural that in this white utopia, Oregon would come to have the largest Ku Klux Klan west of Mississippi. 
Furthermore, in 1922, Oregon elected a man by the name of Walter Pierce, who was a supporter of the Ku Klux Klan, to the seat of governor. Pierce would also go on to represent Oregon in the U.S. House of Representatives between 1932 to 1942. Fast forward a while, and it wouldn't be until the latter half of the 20th century that Oregon ratified two Reconstruction Era amendments. Oregon was one of only six states that originally refused to ratify the 15th Amendment, the amendment that gave Blacks the right to vote, and they would only ratify it as part of Oregon's centennial celebration in 1959. But despite ratifying the 15th Amendment, it would be another 14 years before Oregon ratified the 14th Amendment, the amendment that gave Blacks equal protection under the law. And they would only do so when Oregon's first Black state legislator, William McCoy, felt that it was a priority that while symbolic, Oregon's state constitution should reflect the fact that Black Oregonians had equal protection under the law. Fast forward again, and Oregon will continue this relationship with anti-Black racism well into the contemporary 80s and 90s, when Oregon had the largest skinhead movement in the country, where their goal was to return Oregon to a white homeland. This sets the stage for Coos Bay, 1902, wherein a black man by the name of Alonzo Tucker was lynched. Alonzo was 28, he was married, and he was a boxer from California. When it was reported that Alonzo Tucker had sexually assaulted a white woman, a mob formed to lynch him. The mob stationed people across town and Alonzo was forced to spend the night hiding underneath the mud flats of a local store after escaping police custody. The next morning, he was eventually found, and the crucial detail of this story is that he was found by two young boys. Meaning, this event was so communal that children were involved in the hunt for Alonzo Tucker, just like children were involved in lynchings in the South. Alonzo tried to escape, but he was eventually shot both in the leg and in the upper body. This left him incapacitated and allowed the mob to put a noose around his neck and throw him in the back of the truck. The plan was to lynch him from the spot of the alleged assault. However, they wouldn't make it that far as Alonzo would die from the gunshot wounds. At that point, the mob decided to string him up from a light pole on the Marshfield Bridge and left his body hanging there for several hours. This act was committed in broad daylight without a masked man in the crowd. This lynching made headlines across Oregon and even across the country. Most newspapers were sympathetic to the lynch mob. One newspaper wrote that the crowd which witnessed the last act of the tragedy is estimated at about 300. They were quiet and orderly, and it is safe to say that no such lawless proceedings were ever conducted with less unnecessary disturbance of the peace. Another newspaper wrote that the conduct of the Avengers was marked throughout by quiet orderliness but deadly determination. The sentiment of the community is in sympathy with the lynchers, and it is extremely improbable that any arrests will be made. That would be true. No one would ever be arrested for the lynching of Alonzo Tucker. This brings us to Coos Bay 2020, where I believe we have the chance to recreate our relationship with history. Brian Stevenson, the executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative, says that truth and reconciliation are sequential. And so in order to get to reconciliation, we have to first engage in critical truth telling. I believe the placing of a physical memorial for Alonzo Tucker in the history of lynching is how we engage in this truth telling to alter our collective memory and our collective consciousness. I believe this information should be common knowledge to everyone living in Oregon. What would it do for our society if we more thoughtfully engaged in the implications of racial violence, both historically and contemporarily? I believe it would cause us to reevaluate whether we have truly learned from history. That being said, I don't think reconciliation is an endpoint that's meant to be achieved. I think reconciliation is an ongoing process, one in which you are continually working and are thereby changed because of that process. I think we find reconciliation for a lynching not by our acts of remembrance, but by how those acts of remembrance change us. I think we find reconciliation not by our knowledge of lynching, but by what we do with that knowledge. I think we find reconciliation not by solely reflecting on the past, but by critically evaluating the present. 
because the truth is we are not as far removed from lynching culture as we would like to think. EGI's last recorded lynching occurred in 1946, which means if you are over the age of 74, you lived in the lynching era, which realistically is not that old. There are people still living today with personal memories tied to this era of domestic terrorism. Some of you might remember the name Michael Donald. Michael Donald was a 19 year old African American from Mobile, Alabama, who was chosen at random, beaten and killed by three members of the KKK before they hung his body from a tree. It happened in 1981. Another name you might remember is James Byrd Jr. James Byrd Jr. was a 49 year old from African American from Jasper, Texas, who was killed by three white supremacists when they chained him to the back of their truck and drug him along an asphalt road where his right arm and head would be severed from his body. His body would then be dumped in a local black cemetery. That happened in 1998. So while these killings differ from the way we talk about lynchings of the past because the perpetrators of these acts of violence all face legal prosecution, we are not very far removed from the brutality of lynching. Furthermore, the accusation of a black man sexually assaulting a white woman still creates a social frenzy. We need not look back that far in history to the case of the Central Park Five which once again happened in 1989. For the truth of that story is that story would not have made national news headlines if the victim had been black. If the victim had been black, it would have just been written off as the perils of the hood and no one would have cared. But because the victim was white and the alleged assailants were black and brown, a social frenzy ensued. The same social frenzy that existed during the lynching era. Donald Trump took out an $80,000 ad in the New York Times calling for the reinstatement of the New York death penalty, meaning there were calls for the deaths of these five young men before they had ever had their day in court, just like the lynching era. Those boys would go on to serve between six and 13 years in prison for a crime they didn't commit simply because they were presumed guilty from the very start. The image of black criminality is still reinforced in American culture. We no longer need minstrel shows or racist chromolithography to embed this image into the American consciousness. The oversaturation of African Americans as criminals in television, movies, and local news has the same effect of reinforcing the idea that blacks are dangerous and a threat to white society. The same idea that justified lynching. But if we really want to see how lynching has survived, we need not look further than the American death penalty. Our death penalty is the most direct legacy of lynching. Lynching began to taper off during the 1930s, in large part due to the NAACP's campaign that decried lynching as America's national shame. Hence, your everyday Southerner began to see the barbarity of these events. And so, lynching simply moved indoors, where all white juries and expedited trials carried out the same verdict as the lynch mob. During the 1930s, two thirds of all executions in the United States were of African Americans. Between 1910 and 1950, Despite making up 22% of the South's population, African Americans accounted for 75% of all of those executed in the region. And that disproportionality continues to the day. Where African Americans make up 13% of the population, but 42% of those who are on death row. And when you consider the fact that of that 42%, nearly all are African American males, Yet African-American males only make up 6.5% of our population. 
we have to ask ourselves, how does this happen? How do we get from 6.5 to 42%? The color of your skin still plays a crucial role in whether our society believes you deserve death or not. When we look at someone and are comfortable saying, you deserve to die, that decision is tainted by racial bias. In 2014, there was a study out of the University of Washington that looked at jurors in Washington state and found that jurors were three times more likely to recommend a death sentence for a black defendant than for a white defendant accused of similar crimes. Nearly every sophisticated study that has looked at the issue of race of victim and capital punishment sentencing has found that you are more likely to get the death sentence if the victim is white. We still treat black on white crime differently. Moreover, of the 166 individuals who've been exonerated from death row since the death penalty's reinstatement, meaning individuals who are wrongfully arrested, wrongfully convicted, wrongfully put in prison, wrongfully put on death row, over half have been African-American. We are still trying to kill innocent Black people. How do we let this keep happening? Furthermore, of the states in the South, plus Texas and Oklahoma, had the highest numbers of lynchings. And since the death penalty's reinstatement, those states alone have accounted for 87% of all executions in the United States. The same part of the country that lynched is the same part of the country that executes. People always ask, how did the North tolerate slavery? How did the North tolerate lynching? How did the North tolerate segregation? The answer is the same way we tolerate the South right now. Did you know Germany doesn't have the death penalty. Germany knows that given their history, it would be unconscionable for the country of Germany to systematically execute its citizens, especially if a disproportionate amount of those citizens were Jewish. The world would be in outrage. We in the United States would be outraged if that were the case. So where is that same outrage when given our history, the United States systematically executes its citizens and a disproportionate amount of those citizens are African American? Where is the outrage when given our history as a state, a disproportionate amount of African Americans sit on Oregon's death row? Where is the outrage? Because I don't hear it. If Black Lives Matter, prove it because the legacy of lynching and the power of the noose are still alive today. They just look a little bit different. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Taylor, if you're done with the, the presentation, can we stop the screen share? Thank you. Whew. Wow, very good. Thank you. Let's see, did, did they, if y'all want to respectfully unmute or raise your hand, we could uh, go through questions or just talk. Does anybody have anything they want to say? Sammy, did you get any questions in the chat box? No, there weren't any in the chat box at this point. There is a Thank link, you. though, for, to that uh, the city of Philomath counselors put up uh, with a little bit of more history regarding Oregon. And, and oh, yeah. I'm going to repost that for everybody because if you came in after that was posted, you won't be able to see it. So I'm going to repost that here. Thank you, Sammy. I'll just... Uh... I'll just jump in here and say, Taylor, thank you very much for a very informative uh, presentation and a lot of lot of history and extremely well done. So thank you for sharing tonight. Oh, thank you. Um, if you are interested in following all of this, um, I finally got the Oregon Remembrance Project on social media as of today. 
Uh, so feel free to follow the Oregon Remembrance Project on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and share it with your friends. Um, and hopefully this is just the start of much more. Excellent. Christina, did you want to mention your survey? Yes, thank you, Paul. Um, there is a Facebook group, um, the Alonzo Tucker Project, and um, a few of the admins put together a survey, and I was just hoping to be able to post the link. Um, if you're interested to take a look at the survey, um, it's there's a comment section where you can write in any um, helpful tips that we have been looking for. There was um, grants um, that uh, I believe Cheyenne has been researching. So um, we've been, it, it's in the beginning stages, but we would appreciate anybody that's willing to um, take a look at it, fill it out. We are, um, we think it'll be a really useful tool. Excellent. Yeah, please uh, post the link or URL down in the chat box for us, Christina. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, TC. Can you unmute? Uh, just you. a quick question. Is there a possibility of getting access to the video that um, was shared? Yes. So um, by the end of the week, I should have it posted on uh, the Coos Bay Public Library's YouTube channel. So if you just go to uh, YouTube and search Coos Bay Public Library, you'll find our channel. And I should have that posted, this video posted by the end of the week. Thank you. If you're Thank looking you, for Thank you, the videos that are um, that were in the presentation, you can find them on the Equal Justice Initiatives website under the videos catalog. Yeah, who Great. who did the one with the artwork? Uh, it, it was the Equal Justice Initiative. I can't remember the name of the artist, um, but they've done work with her before, and they they have similar stuff. Um, used that was to impressive. The visual representation of history. Very cool. Carol, did you have a question? Well, <clears throat> yes, I have a question and a proposal. Um, I understand now the <clears throat> need for a physical monument, but also, I want, in addition to that, <clears throat> I wonder what this group would think of the idea of establishing the Alonzo Tucker Memorial Scholarship, say, at SWAC, which I've already talked to them about is it is possible to do that where you can have a <clears throat> perpetual scholarship that could um, be added to every year or whatever they can be added to. So you could have an initial, we could have the whatever, an initial um, raise it fundraiser for this to award an Alonzo Tucker Memorial Scholarship to a student or students of color every year. And so it would be an ongoing event now and into the future. And it would seem to me <clears throat> also uh, honoring Mr. Tucker into the future. I wonder Thank what you. the uh, group would think of something like that. Thank you, Carol. And and um, just just because the library can't take sides on different issues and whatnot, um, I think this this conversation we might want to continue out outside of this program. I know there's a Facebook page, uh, Coos County for Affecting Change, where a lot of people are discussing this. So I, I um, advise people to get involved there. Also, Ariel um, Peasley from the History Museum. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the History Museum in general have been starting conversations around this too. So there, there's a number of conversations in the community um, and, and I can give people contacts, you know, for any of that or links if people are interested in that stuff. And um, I thought I saw, oh, Taylor, somebody had asked, is there actually an Alonzo Tucker um, plaque at, in Alabama right now at um, EJI? Uh, so, at, so the Equal Justice Initiative opened up two museums in April 2018. I mentioned the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. The other one is called the Legacy Museum, where it chronicles the link between slavery and mass incarceration and how slavery didn't end in 1865, it just evolved. And part of that, part of one of the exhibits within the museum is a wall of soil um, that has all these different soil jars from across the country that people have uh, gathered. Uh, and so the, there is a Alonzo Tucker Coos Bay one in 
uh, the museum, in the Legacy Museum. And then in the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, there are, there is a six foot high pillar that has Oregon, Coos County, Alonzo Tucker. Um, there are two of them, one's hanging in the museum and the other is off to the side. Cool, thank you, Taylor. Did anybody else have any questions they want to ask Taylor while we have him? I, I just wanted to say that it's a, such an excellent presentation and um, very powerful. So it's kind of, I'm a bit speechless, but it was very well done. Thank you. Thank also you. still, also still digesting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Eric, did you have something to say? Yeah, just to, just to follow up. Uh, I know that um, uh, the soil uh, sample was was taken um, back in I think March time frame and you were anticipating putting a marker in maybe by end of summer. Um, Taylor I don't know if you can provide any kind of update on the status of that and, and timing of when that might happen. Um, so I'm meeting actually tomorrow at 2 p.m. Uh, there's a task force meeting to sort of talk about what uh, future Alonzo Tucker Memorial uh, Remembrance will look like um, and hopefully we will get some clarity over the next few months and follow the Oregon Remembrance Project on social media and you can stay up to date. Okay, thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Taylor. Anybody else? I, I want to um, mention one thing. Um, I've mentioned to Taylor, um, if you guys are interested in these public spectacle lynchings and these postcards that were produced, there's a fascinating book that came out, gosh, a decade or two ago called Without Sanctuary. And um, one man went around, he collected all these postcards and put them in a book format. It has a forward by John Lewis. Um, <laughs> I hate to recommend things like this, but it is a very powerful book. Um, and, and if you're interested in this kind of thing, it talks about, you know, what Taylor was talking about, how people would get excited. And, and from my recollection, from when this book came out, from what I recall, so many of these postcards were sent through the mail that it clogged the U.S. Postal Service and they had to start banning the lynching postcards because they just couldn't handle the volume. I just wanted to throw that out there. As last closing remarks, um... I would challenge uh, all of you to, to extend this conversation. Um, tell, talk to someone else about what you're, what you're feeling, what you're thinking about. Um, I would say it's fair to say that most people haven't had a conversation about lynching. Um, and I wanna change that. Uh, this is something we should talk about. And I think that we can learn something from having these conversations. Hey, Taylor, it, would it be possible to put a link to your new uh, Remembrance um, Facebook page in there? Uh, <laughs> uh, if I can figure out how to do that. If, if, um, if you could look it up and copy and paste it, maybe? Uh, yeah, that might take a minute. Um, Jan had asked for a link. Could we just search Facebook and find yeah, it? Yeah, just, just go on Facebook, go on Instagram, go on Twitter. I don't really use social media in my personal life, so this is, this so, is all I do. So, Good for you. So like Jan, old person. Jan yeah. go ahead and search it on Facebook. If you can't find it, feel free to um, email me or the library. Uh, my email is just paddis at coosbaylibrary.org. And I'd be happy to find that and send you a link. And uh, to further this conversation in a kind of broader sense, uh, myself, Ariel Peasley from the History Museum, Andrea for the North Bend Library have formed a new book club that um, we have formed just to celebrate diversity and inclusion through reading literature and discussing it. And um, our first meeting is going to be on September 10th. You can get more information at coosbaylibrary.org via our events calendar. Um, we're going to read a memoir by a Black Lives Matter um, memoir member first, but, but then we're going to let the group decide where we go from there and we're just going to explore diverse topics. So people want to continue this conversation with us, please do. All right, Taylor, thank you so much. Oh, it was my pleasure. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having this conversation. Um, and if you want to know how you can support, just spread the word. Spread Excellent. the word and we'll get this work done.
Cool. And thank you. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you, Paul. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Taylor. Thank, thank you, Paul. Thank you. Yep. Take care, everybody. All right. Have a good night, everyone. You too. Thank Muchas you. Gracias. De nada.